Broadcasting live, it's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, how are you doing? I hope you're doing well and you are ready for some Computer America. So obviously today on the program, uh, let's, see, let's see, so today on the program we have computer and technology news for the whole hour. Uh, yesterday we had Sandy Berger, you know, we got to talk a lot uh, with her about the upcoming Amazon Prime Day and things like that. So, you know, today we're going to take it easy. It's just going to be you and me and, well, everyone else as we do computer and technology news. So just real quick. Yeah, so just real quick, uh, first things first, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including a uh, any articles that we do, any uh, videos that we show, any products that we talk about. Anything and everything can be found at ComputerAmerica.com. Also, on top of that, be sure to check out uh, our live video stream and archives of the show, obviously, podcast, and more. Everyone, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in, and let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, we're doing computer and technology news, and that is brought to you by Computer America. Let's go ahead. Now, we have a lot of different, uh, well, a lot of different stories, and it's pretty cool. So, this, uh, we should probably start with one of the biggest uh stories first and that is the fact that twitter you know there's uh there's only a handful of massive social media companies out there twitter being a very popular one because it's so easy to get the word out and well the word out is uh twitter is down worldwide and this was about 45 minutes ago and well it's back up as of this moment but it did go down for an hour you weren't crazy and uh hey it uh it happened during a couple of uh very big events. So Twitter is currently out of order for, for uh, with, of course, uh, yeah, Twitter is out of order. Tweets aren't loading in the app or on the desktop for several in gadget editors. And while down detector has a massive spike in outage reports, we check reports from use of Twitter, but you know, that's a little tough at the moment. So obviously they're currently investigating the issues. I think they solved it. We won't know what exactly caused it, but uh, yeah, this is pretty unusual. Uh, you know, for why this happens. And by the way, Twitter came up about, um, yeah, about 10 minutes ago as of this reading. So, you know, hey, pretty, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So obviously I don't think, uh, you know, there's some people who are really going to like that and some people who won't, but uh, yeah, Twitter was down, back up, very unusual. Okay, so that's just a basic one. Let's go ahead and talk about some of these larger ones. How about we discuss? Um, how about we discuss Microsoft? Yes, Microsoft. Well, turns out they have a new three hundred and ninety-nine dollar. If you are looking for a way to burn four hundred bucks, a new Azure Connect AI camera is now shipping in the U.S. and China. And you can see an image of it here. Uh, looks like an oversized webcam that you would you know kind of put on top of your monitor. Uh, you know, one giant lens uh, looks like an infra, uh, an infrared detector, 
and you know just kind of all housed in this giant unit so microsoft announced the return of its connect sensor in the form of an ai developer kit you know because a lot of uh a lot of Kinects were actually uh, obviously sold for the Kinects and the Xbox and video games and motion control gaming. Uh, that was hit or miss. I mean, you know, people had it. I don't think it really gained all that much traction, judging by the fact that, well, we're all not playing games by moving around in our rooms. But uh, a, a one huge place that Kinect did seem to shine in was the do-it-yourself crowd in scientific laboratories and places like that because it had very good sensors it had depth sensing it had you know obviously think of everything that you need to detect someone's movements and how subtle those can be for uh for video games and how useful that kind of technology could be you know fully packaged ready to go ready to ready to be implemented into uh, research for universities, research for private development. Uh, yeah, it, it really excelled as kind of a do-it-yourself uh, piece of really science. And it looks like that's where it's going to continue to live on. The $400 Azure Connect DK camera system, if you're looking for it, includes a one megapixel depth camera. So obviously this is not going to be for taking the best photos you've ever seen but it is going to be for obviously depth camera and for motion sensing a 360 degree microphone 12 megapixel rgb camera so you can actually see what you're looking at but again not the best camera we've seen and an orientation sensor all in a relatively small package the kit has been available for pre-order for a few months but the company has announced today it's now generally available and shipping to pre-order customers in the U.S. and China. And you can see an image of it here as well. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. Now, uh, yeah, so obviously unlike the original Kinect, which launched with the Xbox gaming accessory, they said that the Azure Kinect is all business. So if you, I mean, odds are you probably won't one of the, you won't, you won't want one of these unless you are in a research role or if you have some kind of AI training that you need to do. You can see how this would be helpful for, let's say someone like Amazon, if they want to study how people move and how their robots move and things like that, to better gather data on how to make uh, autonomous robots better. You can see where it would really come in handy. So to help developers get started, the company has already launched a number of uh, SDKs, which are, of course, uh, uh, software, de uh, software developer kits, I believe. Uh, and uh, they also include a preview of body tracking SDK that is close to what you may remember from the Kinect's Xbox days. So with uh, yeah, so with that being said, and you can even see uh, you know the the Microsoft press event here. You can see what it looks like. It's honestly, it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, the company is positioning the device as an easy gateway for its users in health and life sciences, retails, logistics, and robotics to start experimenting with using depth sensing and machine learning. We've seen somewhat similar development kits for others, including Microsoft partner Qualcomm, though these devices usually, uh, they don't usually have the depth camera that make the Kinect, uh, that make the Kinect DK a Kinect. So this is again, uh, the, the next iteration of, well, yeah, this is the next iteration of the Kinect, it's just the Kinect seems to be moving away from video games and Microsoft sees this as a business move, which, you know, out of all of the things that we've seen from, uh, you know, from these companies, from IBM, from uh, Microsoft and so many other companies, the business sector seems to be way, 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 way more lucrative than the, oh, than the, uh, the consumer field. So even Logitech has been starting to launch some of the, you know, some of the more prosumer slash business type uh, products. And yeah, it looks like it continues to move that way. So again, the Microsoft uh, Azure Connect is now available, well, in the US and China, but you probably still won't want one. There you go. 
Now, lots of great stories, and some of them are really strange. They're a real head scratcher. So let's go ahead and uh, actually do a quick update. This one shouldn't take long. It's a quick update to a story that we did uh, about three days ago. It turns out you can't just call people the villains of the internet and not get some kind of backlash. Well, hey, maybe if you call the correct people the villains of the internet, you may be in the clear, but not Mozilla. They said that uh, Mozilla aren't the villain after all. ISPs back down after a public outcry, and this coming to us from uh, from Naked Securities, and well, Naked Security, and saying that a few short days ago, uh, they wrote up about how Mozilla was up for an internet award for cyber villainy, and they said that uh, you know at uh, this publication, uh, they didn't see that one coming, but it's no lie. The UK Internet uh, Service Providers Association, or the ISPA for, again, the UK, shortlisted Mozilla for the dishonorable title of the 2019 Internet Villain. If you didn't know that, uh, well, hey, if you didn't know why, it's because Mozilla will soon, by default, start hosting uh, HTTP, or DNS over HTTPS, which... Um, Let's see, they have a quick summary here in the article, if this, makes, uh, if this uh, makes sense to you. DNS, as you probably know, is the global service that connects names like example.com into a network address like 203.0.11.42, essentially turning human inputs into numerical inputs that, uh, that computers can relay to one another. And HTTPS is the protocol that puts the padlock on your browser's address bar, which if you're watching, well, no, you can't see it in, on the video portion, but yeah, uh, the little padlock is essentially, uh, the little padlock is a handshake that uh, you pay a third party to then go between you and whoever's trying to visit your site and essentially say, that, or you and whoever site you're trying to visit and say, they paid us money and therefore they are who they say they are because who wouldn't, you know, they, no one else has paid us money and this is the correct website. So essentially it's that handshake that goes over and now put them together. You have DNS over HTTPS. It's a way of encrypting and authenticating your network lookups while you're online. And here's the thing. DNS over HTTPS offers improved privacy, better resistance to unauthorized surveillance and safer browsing. That's right saying that, well, essentially your sites of interest remain private and of, co and of course, turn uh, in which turn keeps you more secure against snooping, surveillance, and sneaky substitutions. Um, overall, this is, this is an improvement, as, uh, as Mozilla said, this is an improvement on decades old technology. This is strictly good for privacy, for security, and so on and so forth, but the problem is, the powers that be, and in this case, the UK's Internet Service Providers Association, they see it as kind of an undercut because they would no longer be able to accomplish what they've been doing for decades. And that is snooping on packets. They are looking at where you're going. They are looking at what you're doing. And uh, yeah, they don't want to lose that kind of ability, which DNS over HTTPS, which again, Mozilla is going to start enabling by default, uh, yeah, is going to do. So there you go. And uh, I think we're going to go ahead and kind of leave that there. And by the way, uh, the whole point of this article, again, was that ISPs backed down uh, for saying that. They said that the reason, well, uh, they said that Mozilla would suddenly make the internet too secure, too private, too safe, too well protected from busybodies, snoops, and crooks. Horror of horrors, British ISPs would no longer be able to collect, uh, to collect and collate innocent users' high-level internet browsing habits themselves just in case the data ever becomes handy for busting actual crooks. Yeah. So with that being said, the denomination also tries to persuade us all that the villain category is intended to draw attention to an important issue in a lighthearted manner, but this year clearly sent the wrong message. End quote. There you go. That was the uh, that was a statement that was uh, not an apology, as the article mentions, but uh, well, hey. It's, uh, it's definitely a pullback. Mozilla is no longer the villain of the internet. Okay. There's that one. Uh, very, very interesting that they were quick to uh, pull back from it, which is good to see. You know, we like that. Uh, okay. Let's go ahead and talk about... Okay. 
we have we have a couple stories here and uh all right you know since we just did an update we can do another update and this has to do with a particular lawyer uh we covered the story two three weeks ago so uh, we're gonna catch you up if you didn't happen to catch it but uh all right so the title from bbc news is essentially porn pirating lawyer jailed for five years and again if you don't recall uh you know before we get into the article and see what happened uh this was a lawyer and a couple of lawyers who actually all right so there's peer-to-peer file sharing there is illegally downloading videos and copyrighted material which obviously pornography falls under well tie all that together a couple and i want to say a couple like one and his law firm and i think there were two and three that uh that worked with the authorities and cut a plea bargain but this is you know really the supposed ringleader of the whole thing he uh he would upload copyrighted material himself illegally distributing it himself in the hopes of actually letting others download what he uploaded illegally and then he would track who did it because uh, I might have been a keylogger or some other way that he was able to log their IP address and find them, send them a, obviously using his law firm's letterhead, and say, hey, we know that you illegally downloaded pornography. Therefore, you owe us, well, essentially, we're going to sue you for all your worth, and, you know, copyright is a serious thing, copyright infringement, it, you know, deserves attention, and so on and so forth until they said, pay us a couple of thousand dollars and we'll make it go away. And obviously a couple of thousand dollars is much less than it would be to fight it through the courts. And especially because at the end of the day, everyone's wrong here. Uh, the people didn't know that the lawyer was the one who uploaded it initially. And the people who downloaded you know, the material, they know that they're in the wrong. So you know, actually fighting it in court probably isn't what they were inclined to do. Now, with that being said, he was caught. He was caught red-handed, and it's, um, yeah, he, he was caught, and now we have an actual sentencing saying that, uh, and by the way, his name was John Steele. He co-founded a firm called Prenda Law that ran the trolling scheme, and they said that his partner was jailed for 14 years in June, so, you know, uh, plea, maybe not plea, he was just sentenced for 14 years. Steele faced a sentence of more than 10 years, but this was reduced because he cooperated with prosecutors. So he was the one to actually cut the plea deal. Okay, so the other guy got 14. This guy got, well, five. And by the way, if you're wondering how much this kind of scheme pays, turns out about 4.8 million euro, which translates to about 6 million bucks. Yeah, they were very good at what they did. Sounds like entrapment. Yes, to a certain extent, because obviously they were, uh, you know, they were uploading this material strictly for, well, they were illegally uploading material, first of all, just to catch other people who would illegally download the material. Uh, entrapment, I think, kind of implies there's uh, law enforcement is trying to get you in trouble. You know, they, they lay out a piece of candy and, you know, that's very tantalizing and, you know, just in the hopes that someone will take the bait. Uh, that's more of a law enforcement thing. This is strictly a lawyer being a CD lawyer. So in addition, the fees paid by many of the alleged pirates have been funneled through shell companies to hide the fact that they were actually going to the two, uh, you know, the, the two lawyers who were now in jail. Uh, they said that he had made a series of stupid decisions, which is what he told the court, and his lawyer agreed, adding his actions had been reprehensible, abhorrent, and criminal. Steele and Hansmeyer have been ordered to repay 1.5 million to victims of the well piracy scheme. I'm hoping, I'm hoping through fines and fees, they uh, they don't get to keep the six million, and they, or at least you know having to repay 1.5 million, they wouldn't get to keep the 4.5 million. There's no word of that, but uh, I don't know. 4.5 million dollars. Uh, I I I've heard I've heard of worse paychecks. Uh, let's hope it doesn't pay off for these guys, even if they lose five to 14 years of their lives. Okay, so there's an update, five years uh, in prison for that dude. And by the way, don't do that, folks. It's uh, it's bad, it's wrong, it's uh, also illegal. So there you go. 
not giving anyone ideas. Now, there's uh, speaking of what sounds like should be illegal, and to be clear, that was. Uh, how about this one? So the elections are coming up. Hey, if you uh, if you didn't know, there's this whole political system in the United States, and well, as far as Computer America is concerned, we care about election security. And when it comes to digitizing the elections, more and more we have seen. Uh, tech trends, you know, especially with the 2016 elections and what happened with, uh, you know, the whole 2016 election and the Russian thing, blah, blah, blah. The point is voting manipulation so far hadn't, well, you know, we really hadn't tracked it down to a voting machine. Obviously, auditing these things and the necessity for keeping paper ballots kind of seems like a throwback. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we have some of the best technology we have ever had. And I mean, technology really only moves forward. And to hear that voting machines in more and more states were passing uh, laws, essentially saying that, hey, you can have voting machines, but they must be backed up with paper copies and have a paper trail. I get it. It's cool. You know, that's, um, that's a good way to verify the information that's being put into them so that manipulation doesn't happen, which is what you want to hear. But at the same time, voting machines in general are such a poorly run scheme that essentially every election, uh, and we're talking about in the United States, there is no one provider of voting machines. Uh, voting, voting machine makers come in all shapes and sizes. They, uh, every single uh, municipality, or I guess every city, every district, every voting precinct, uh, they all have to make their own deal with a voting machine maker. There's not, you know, the U.S. government doesn't say, oh, you can only buy your voting machine, uh, your voting machines from ABC company. No, you have, or, you know, just anyone that pleases you and go ahead and keep a trail. This ran into a lot of problems when it came to the 2016 elections. We heard about how woefully lacking security was for a lot of these machines. Uh, it was just really fly by night. Now, turns out it hasn't gotten much better. And check this one out. This is a story from Tech Dirt saying that voting machine makers claim that the names of the entities that own them are trade secrets. Could you imagine if you had to climb on a bus and the bus was secret? It's like, oh, I'm sorry, who owns this? Who's operating this? Who am I looking at? And they say, no, 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 you don't need to know that information. Except instead of the bus, it's the fundamentals of democracy, which is your vote. It's, um, you know, voting is, is obviously very important. And the apparatus in which you vote with, also very important. Now, let's go ahead and, and uh, oh, and it looks like we have another story here we'll catch in just a minute. But on June, so recently, the North Carolina State Board of Elections, and who knew it'd be North Carolina, our great state, good Lord, so asked suppliers of electronic voting machines a simple question, who owns you? Which is actually, you know, a pretty easy question. And they said that the State Board of Elections requested that your companies disclose any owners or shareholders with a 5% or greater interest in share in each vendor's company, any subsidiary company of the vendor and the vendor's parent company. So as the article mentions, and by the way, this is again from uh, from TechDirt and uh, let's see. So this is from TechDirt. I'm, try- I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the uh, the author by Tim Cushing. There we go. They said that this seems like very basic information, information that the board should know and should be able to pass on to the general public. After all, these are the makers of devices used by the public while electing their representatives. Obviously, if there are, you know, some kind of conflicts of interest, if a particular company has ties to a particular candidate and they own, let's say, 51% of a company that is distributing the, uh, that is distributing the voting machines, hey, maybe there's something there that we need to kind of further oversight and, you know, kind of keep an eye on. Uh, So as they say, they should know who's running these companies and who their majority stakeholders are. If something goes wrong, they should know who's ultimately responsible for the latest debacle. That as well. Uh, It's not like the state was asking the manufacturers to cough up code and machine schematics. All it wanted to know is that the people behind the company and, well, 
Who are they? Uh, but, the re but the responses the board received indicate voting system manufacturers believe releasing any information about their company's compositions will somehow compromise their market advantage. You know, when someone says, hey, there's nothing to see here, don't worry about it, you can't look because it'll be really bad for us, maybe that's something worth looking into. So obviously, Hart, uh, so Hart InterCivic said letting the public know that the company is owned by HIG Hart, LLC, and Greg L. Burt is a fact that would devalue the company if it were made public. Well, there you go. Uh, they said that Hart InterCivic, a corporation that derives independent actual value from its information not being generally known or readily attainable and making reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy of this information, requests that it be designated as a trade secret. Yeah, and obviously, uh, Melter Snowflakes in the chat room either make names public or stop selling the, the devices in the state. And that's the problem, is that there's only so many companies that are going to be able to sell these things well reputably and i'm not saying that there's any kind of and honestly i don't know the statistics when it comes to are there enough people making voting machines that you have your choice of you know kind of going with someone else if they choose to, to deny this but they generally have contracts and let's face it the uh, the 2020 elections they're coming up here in about a year you know, or even less. I honestly have no idea when the next elections are coming up, but we have less than a year. It's it's really hard to find time to shop around and completely switch providers and switch machines that you're going to be using. We're kind of locked in, and you're right. Uh, they should. This information should definitely be public. So, electronic systems and software said basically the same the same thing, claiming that the information is proprietary and confidential information. And by the way, they even have a letter here saying that the following individuals and or entities own 5% or more shares of the Government Systems so uh, Software and Services, Inc., uh, which is the McCarthy Group, LLC, Tom Burt, and Tom O'Brien. Hmm. So obviously, Clear Ballot, who is another one. So we have three now, Heart InterCivic, Electronic Systems and Software, and Clear Ballot all claim that uh, their owners are a trade secret. And they said for a list of our shareholders with a 5% or greater share of Clear Ballot Group, we have no other parent companies or subsidiaries. And they have a number of people there, including Raging Capital Opportunity Fund 5 LLC, as long as with a, a, a couple of other people. So they said that even with this minimal amount of transparency had to be extracted at board point. So while it's true private companies such as these are under no obligation to inform the public about the details of their ownership, they're all involved in providing goods and services to government agencies. And it just seems like as your customer, you know, which would be really everyone, it's the U.S. government and by extension all of us, that level of transparency and just having the ownership, who, who is in charge, who is profiting off of these contracts, who is it? You know, that should be really basic information. So they said that uh, obviously there's plenty of secrecy to go around. Election security advocate Lynn Bernstein says that the ownership of voting machine companies is a deliberate multi-layered mess designed to obscure who's running these shops and to possibly hide a bunch of stuff that looks like corruption, fraud, and general financial malfeasance. And that is again by uh, an election security advocate. Which, as we said before, you know, if uh, if there's something that they feel there's worth hiding, uh, that is almost reason enough for us to go looking for it. I know that uh, for individuals and private companies, that's a very hard line. But at the same time, we have seen a lot of just poor managing when it comes to election security. So there you go. Obviously, the government can't do everything itself. It will need vendors to supply the goods and services, but these vendors need to operate under the same transparency the government is forced to if they want to secure these lucrative contracts. Voters aren't given a choice in voting machine providers. They're stuck with whatever their government gives them. But when the government actually, well, hey, if they actually decide to perform a little vetting, that makes the machine trust uh, trusted to deliver the accurate vote count, want to hide behind a trade secret, 
Well, hey, that makes that a little suspect. There you go. So obviously, it's no surprise that they're extremely reluctant to share any details with the voting public, but that doesn't make them right. It just makes them a little bit more evil. So we found that very interesting. And as you said, we're going to be heading into the uh, the voting, well, the, the election here shortly. And I don't know, as an area of interest when it comes to technology, I think that, um, yeah, election election uh oh how do you say this voting machines are just very very important so with that being said we are going to go ahead and there's the music we're going to go to a break here in just a moment everyone stay tuned more computer america and more computer and technology news right after this thank you so much for tuning in stay tuned we'll be right back Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And we had it muted. So hello, everyone. Welcome into the Computer America Show. Thank you for catching that, Craig. Uh, and everyone out there, hey, welcome into the program. Uh, all right, so I just said everything. I have to say it again. Uh, podcast, if you miss any part of it, then uh, feel free to check out the podcast, uh, you know, wherever podcasts are heard. And, of course, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and just say that uh, we just wrapped up a story about the uh, the voting machine makers and how they – really try to identify that, uh, well, who makes the voting machines seems to be a trade secret. Who knew? So everyone, go ahead uh, and check that out in the uh, in the podcast. So, okay, everyone, let's go ahead and now talk about this next story. Same publication, Tech Dirt. Uh, I saw this over on the sidebar, and I'm very interested in this one. Uh, yep, this one just came out today, so it is very timely, but... I'm also very interested in this because Computer America has run into this as well. 
even though we are a uh, we are a news organization, we try to do fair use. We try not to play any kind of copyrighted material for any kind of uh, long long durations. Uh, we never try to profit off of you know trying to uh, play someone's commercial that we want to talk about. If we're trying to talk about a product, we never try to say, hey, this is our product, and you need to buy it from us. Uh, you know, we're very open about what we do here as a news organization. Even we run afoul of YouTube's overly, overly touchy and overly sensitive. Uh, their system to find copyrighted material and take it down. So here we go. This article just came out today. YouTube finally demands specif uh, specificity, tough word, from copyright claimants saying that at long last, YouTube is rolling out changes to its copyright claim system, where for years it has been heavily slanted in favor of the copyright claimants, or in other words, uh, the people who are trying to take the content down, they were given essentially the, the benefit of the doubt. So uh, with that being said, and uh, let's see. So with that being said, let's go ahead and just talk about uh, saying that at long last, YouTube is rolling out changes for years. It has been heavily slanted in favor of copyright claimants. Concessions made by YouTube to legacy industries screwed the whole thing up and giving claimants credibility they hadn't earned in exchange for, well, a free platform to distribute their content with. Win-win for them, lose-lose for everyone else. So obviously, add this to the whole content ID if you, and of course, mess if you want to have a mess. It's a mess that results in the sort of dystopian outcomes no one ever expected from an online video platform. Saying that you could be considered well past the bounds of suspension of disbelief if it appeared in speculative fiction. Bird calls, that's right, bird calls, getting hit with copyright claims white noise videos being flagged multiple times for multiple rights holders. I remember that one. Someone actually uploaded, I think it was like a 10 hour video of just simple static that they recorded on their radio. Yes, white noise, the cosmic background noise that is owned by no one was taken down multiple times. Yeah. It was very overzealous. Now, copyright owners nuking other people's or, uh, original creations due to flaws in the auto moderation, creators being told that the best person to take up their copyright dispute is with, well, themselves. And in that case, I recall that uh, YouTube was actually taking down content that was produced by the same person that was uploading it. It was uh, to say, I've used the word overzealous a couple times here. It was. Uh, it was a catastrophe for a lot of people. Content moderation on the scale of YouTube, and obviously uh, it's, you know, whenever something goes wrong, it gets a lot of, it gets a lot of pu uh, publicity. There we go. Uh, but they have 500 hours of video to police every single minute. And there are people out there who do want to, well, profit off of other people's work. And if you consider that you have to sift through, what is that, 500 hours a minute, let's just say 60 minutes. So in a single hour, you're looking at about, what, 30,000 hours every hour. Multiply that by 24, and you're looking at, what is that, uh, 72? 72, maybe. Yeah, uh, 720,000 hours of video every single day that they have to police. And some of it will be just straight up movie rips. They will be other people's stuff. They will be explicit material that should not be on YouTube. How do you do it? And you can't do it with people. You have to do it with an, with an automatic system. It's just that the automatic system wasn't that good either. Now, so here's some good news. Several years and millions of hours of uploaded videos later, they said that uh, YouTube is updating the way it handles manual copyright claims with change that would make them much less of a headache for video creators. Owners of copyrighted content, like a record label or a movie studio, will now have to say exactly where in the video their copyright material appears, which they didn't have to do in the past when manually reporting infringement. 
That'll allow the creator to easily verify whether or not the claim is legitimate and to then edit out the content if they don't want to deal with that with the repercussions like losing revenue or having the video taken down. Saying that the full rollout is discussed in more detail on YouTube's blog, it appears that YouTube is struggling to stop videos containing short, incidental clips of music for being flagged by its content ID system. And obviously they said that we also heard firsthand that our manual claiming system has, or I'm sorry, was increasingly being used to claim very short and in some cases one second content or incidental content like your creator walked past the store playing a few seconds of music. We are already looking into this issue, but hearing this, uh, this directly from creators was vital. We are exploring the improvements and striking the right balance between copyright owners and creators. Obviously, there's fair use. If you walk by a store that is playing, uh, that is playing music in the background, hey, you, you know, obviously you did not gather the rights to play that, but it's just in the background. You know, it's it's you living your life, and it just happens to be there. Uh, there's a big difference. So obviously, uh, fair use isn't a defense when copyright claims are made and everyone hit with a potential strike is considered uh, is considered to be an infringer. At least now they'll be able to avoid strikes a little easier. But the system is still tilted and presumes the claimant is correct and it's the recipient of the notice who must make changes to avoid losing their income or their accounts or both. So let's just hope overall we're going to go ahead and end it there. Let's just hope that uh, it's just a good thing that they are stepping up their security. So let's go ahead and uh, and talk about, we have a couple of, okay, this is one of the biggest stories of the day. Uh, sorry to bury the lead, but hey, former Tesla employee admits uploading autopilot source code to his iCloud. It's right. If nothing else, this is literally corporate espionage at the expense of Tesla and, of course, at the expense of the American, well, at uh, at the expense of American industry. And this is by Sean O'Kane for The Verge, saying that Tesla believes he stole company trade secrets and took them to a Chinese startup, Xiaopeng Motors. Yeah, and let me tell you. When you work a decade on, you know, essentially what it is Tesla's been working on, or even longer, it's, um, you know, stealing that source code, that's that's stealing the secret sauce, it's stealing the recipe, and it's unfortunately just kind of really, really hard to kind of put the genie back in the bottle, and this is going to be pretty bad for Tesla. Now, uh, so Guan, Guanji Chao, or Cao who is a former engineer at Tesla, admitted in a court filing this week that he uploaded zip files containing autopilot source code to his personal iCloud account in late 2018 while still working for the company. Tesla sued Cow earlier this year for allegedly stealing trade secrets related to autopilot and bringing them to Chinese electric vehicle startup Xia, uh, yeah, uh, Xiaopeng Motors. Also known as X Motors or X X Peng, which is backed by tech giant Alibaba, and that's really the important thing. You know, it's not just some random car startup because we've all seen how hard it is to get a car company, you know, kind of up and off the ground. But it's Alibaba, which is one of the largest companies in the world, now has access to Tesla's autopilot source code. Cow denied stealing sensitive information from the automaker in the same filing. His legal team argued that he made extensive efforts to delete and or remove any such Tesla files prior to his separation from Tesla. Cow is now the head of perception at Xpeng, where he is developing and delivering autonomous driving technologies for production cars. And obviously, you can see where having the source code for auto for Tesla Autopilot would be very helpful for his new position. Now, according to a joint filing from the two parties that was also filed this week, Tesla has subpoenaed documents from Apple, and while Apple is not involved in the case, a former employee who worked with the tech company's secretive autonomous car project was charged by the FBI with stealing trade secrets last July. There's a lot of... Uh, intellectual property theft 
that happens from the U.S. to China. Happens all the time. It's an unfortunate reality. And I don't want to say this could lead to racism. But Chinese nationals seem to be involved a lot. And there are many, 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 you know, there's 1.3 billion Chinese nationals out there. Uh, you know, you can't let the, the, you can't let the miss, the misactions, the, you know, the poor actions of a few paint the entire billion people with, a, you know, in a bad light. But this could make tech companies, <coughs> sorry, this could make tech companies very hesitant to hire people who are, who actually maintain a Chinese citizenship. So obviously, uh, the employee allegedly airdropped sensitive data to his wife's laptop and also caught on CCTV, leaving Apple's campus with a box of equipment. He had left his job at Apple to take a position at Xpeng before being arrested. Cao was also a senior image scientist for Apple for two years before he joined Tesla. And the suit comes at a time when the U.S. is locked in a trade war with China. And of course, they are being accused of economic espionage. Uh, so there you go. In a statement with The Verge earlier, earlier this year, Xpeng said it opened an internal investigation into Tesla's allegation and it fully respects any third party intellectual property rights and confidential information. And they said that it by no means caused or attempted to, to cause Mr. Cow to misappropriate trade secrets, confidential and proprietary information of Tesla, whether such allegations by Tesla are true or not. And, well, hey, they said they weren't aware of any misconduct. So let's go ahead and, uh, and just say that Cal was one, of the, was one of around 40 people, only 40, 40 employees with direct access to the autopilot source code. So there weren't many people who could have messed this up. You know, it's not like this is a, uh, this is a file that could have been acquired by 10,000 people or 10,000 employees. Nope, just 40. Uh, so he deleted 120,000 files off his work computer, disconnected his personal iCloud account, and deleted his browser history all around the same time that he accepted that he accepted the job at Xpeng. And uh, Tesla also claimed that Cal recruited another autopilot employee to, well, hey, to the company in February. So he admits that he used personal iCloud accounts to create backup copies of certain Tesla information in 2018. He admits that he created zip files containing the autopilot source code in late 2018 and confirmed that Xpeng extended him an offer in a letter in December, uh, I'm sorry, on December 12th in 2018. Uh, he says that he disconnected his personal iCloud account from the Tesla issued computer on about December 26th and kept logging into Tesla networks between December 27th and January 1st. Uh, so while Cow does not specifically, uh, I'm sorry, does not specify when he formally accepted the job, he said that his last day was January 3rd. And he also denies poaching any employees from the autopilot team. So we're gonna go ahead and leave that there. Uh, this court case is gonna go through. This is not the first time we've seen something like this happen. Uh, we've seen Tesla employees go to Everyone from like Uber to Apple to more and more. Here's the thing. Self-driving cars are going to be a multi-billion dollar industry. Hundreds of billions of dollars are at stake here or even more because it's going to affect so many aspects of our lives. And when it's something that is so new, so revolutionary, so cutting edge, only so many people are going to have any kind of expertise. Uh, you can have people who are going to college right now, but they won't have any work work experience in that level of computer science uh, or information technology. And you could have uh, you know people who have been working in the field for a number of years who maybe just do uh, cameras or they do networking. But artificial intelligence, self driving, uh, this level of automation is all relatively scarce when it comes to actual people with actual work experience. And so poaching happens all the time. Uh, poaching of trade secrets though, 
that's a much bigger deal because that's not just a person with experience, which is in high demand and they should, you know, go wherever they feel they need to go. But the trade secrets are in even higher demand. And that seems to be what gets a lot of people from one company to another is that they get to take the trade secrets with them, unfortunately. Now, uh, so that's the end of that. Again, we're going to look into what the courts actually decide, but man, scary stuff. Okay, so uh, with that being said, let's see, let's see, let's see. So um, we have a couple of different articles here. This one's pretty big. Amazon. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a tech segment if we didn't talk about Amazon specifically. Check this out. Amazon invests seven hundred million dollars to train a third of its U.S. workforce by twenty twenty five. Hey, reinvestment in the American workforce. What is bad about that? Amazon announced this morning its plan to invest more than seven hundred million dollars to retrain workers across the U.S. to allow them to move into skilled technical and non technical roles. Across its corporate offices, tech hubs, fulfillment centers, retail stores, and transportation network, saying that the company's goal is to upskill about 100,000 of its U.S. employees for more in demand jobs by 2025, or about one in three of Amazon's U.S. workers. That should really be a wake up call for a lot of people. Not even so much, hey, here's uh, you know, here's what Amazon's doing or hey, here's them investing. This should be a wake-up call. Where it feels like they're saying in the next 5 years or the next 6 years by 2025, if they don't develop their workforce to have better and different skills than the ones that they currently have due to automation, they will no longer need 100,000 employees. They're going to be transitioning from one place to another. Uh, They're going to be in, well, you know, and they could fire warehouse workers and hire, uh, you know, uh, coordination specialists or logistics specialists and things like that. But essentially a third of his workforce would lose a job due to automation if they don't develop a new skill set. Saying that in particular, Amazon has its its eye on job roles like data mapping specialist, data scientist, solution architect, and business analyst, as well as logistics coordinator, process improvement manager, and transportation specialist. Saying that based on a review of its workforce, these are the fastest growing, highly skilled jobs over the past five years. Saying that for example, data mapping specialist. If you don't know what that is, Maybe it's worth looking into because it has seen a job growth rate of about 832% in the past five years. And they said that while data scientists grew only about 505%, solution architect grew 454, uh, security engineer jobs grew 229%, and the business analyst job grew about 160%. Meanwhile, the highly skilled job roles in customer fulfillment have grown by 400%. Who knew Amazon was growing? So Amazon is expected to reach about 300,000 employees this year, and it will reach 630,000 employees worldwide. It's pretty incredible. The retraining investments break down to about $7,000 per worker and is one of the largest corporate retraining programs to date, but probably still very, uh, very needed. So the funding will be distributed across a range of programs, including both existing programs and new initiatives. It will be focused on training people both with and without existing technical backgrounds. And these programs include new Amazon Technical Academy, which will train non-technical Amazon employees with skills that will allow them to transition to software and engineering careers. So Amazon is, uh, I'm sorry, Amazon will also expand its career choice program launched in 2012, which offers prepaid tuition uh, to fulfillment center associates who want to move into high demand jobs, plus Amazon apprenticeship, a department of labor certified program offering paid classroom training and on the job training with Amazon. There you go. So the investments follow Amazon raising of uh, obviously minimum wage to $15 for every U.S. employee and contractor. And obviously Bernie Sanders has called out Amazon for engaging in corporate welfare. 
overall, I don't know. It's, um, yeah, uh, Jeff Bezos later challenged other retailers to follow his lead to raise the minimum wage as well, but that's easier said than done as Amazon so far uh, ahead that its nearest e-commerce competitor, which is Walmart, is losing about a billion dollars this year on its e-commerce division as it tries to catch up. So obviously Amazon is doing so well. The question is, is what they're doing good? Yes, obviously, but is what they're doing enough? That's a question that, uh, that I think needs to be asked. So, But hey, it's definitely good. It's definitely good. I like that. Now we have time for one more story. And because we just did a story all about AI, why don't we go ahead and talk about AI as well? Facebook. Check this one out. And we've talked about artificial intelligence and its ability to operate on incomplete information. You know, it's one thing to say, uh, you know, give a give a computer two pictures and say, what is this picture? What is that picture? Um, you know, pick one, you give it all the information. It knows all the information about the situation and it has to make a decision. That's pretty easy. Uh, artificial intelligence has been able to do that for a while, but when it comes to poker, they have to operate on incomplete information because the only information that the poker bot would know if it's sitting at a table with, let's say five other people is, the artificial intelligence will know what card it has, what cards have been played, and what cards the dealer has. That's about it. Everything else has to be assumed. And artificial intelligence, they're working on assuming robots. So this article is a bit long. We're going to have to you know, kind of breeze through it. But this is from uh, Chris Holt from Engadget. And Facebook and CMU's Poker AI beat five pros at once. It's the first time a bot has bested more than one human at the same time. So, you heard it. Facebook and Carnegie Mellon University have built another artificial intelligence robot that beats some of the top poker pros. And while AI bots have been the best professional players one-on-one -on -one, uh, competition, Facebook claims it's the first time a bot has been able to top in any major benchmark game where there's more than one opponent at a time. Pluribus, who is the name of the AI, bested professional in No Limit Texas Hold'em in a couple of different formats. Five AI bots and one human, and one bot and five real players. The research behind Pluribus uh, yeah, wrote in a paper published in Science that creating such a multiplayer bot is a recognized AI milestone. Where, and they mention here, uh, in the likes of Chess and Go, everything is laid out in the open, but in poker, there's hidden information like I was talking about that uh, that brings different complex strategies to poker not seen, uh, not seen in other games, including, well, bluffing. And as such, AI bots have typically struggled to account for hidden information and effectively act on it. Never think about an AI robot bluffing, but there you go. Uh, they said that it's a more advanced version of the previous bot which beat pros in a head-to-head -head play up uh, a couple of years ago. And there's a new online search algorithm that let them look at available options for a few moves ahead and not just the end of the game. Uh, it also had faster self-play algorithms for games with hidden information, meaning that it was more efficient in learning how to deal with hidden information in games the bot played against copies of itself. So there you go. Uh, they said that if each chip was a dollar, Pluribus would have won an average of about $5 per hand and it would have made about $1,000 per hour of playing against five human players. These results are considered a decisive margin of victory by poker professionals. So obviously, uh, you know, he won consistently. And, you know, you don't have to win it all. You don't have to win uh, every single penny. You just have to win consistently. Uh, the pro seemed intrigued by the types of strategies that the AI employed, such as the atypical move of kicking off a round with a bet after calling the previous go around. Uh, it was incredibly fascinating getting to play against the poker bot and seeing some of the strategy strategies it chose. There were several plays that humans simply are not making at all, especially relating to its bet, to its bet sizing. Uh, and another pro said that the bot is a very hard opponent to play against. It's really hard to pin him down on any kind of hand. He's also very good at making thin value bets on the river. 
he's very good at extracting value over his good hand. There you go. So obviously, uh, very, very complicated, but I did think that was a very interesting article because, hey, uh, AI bot beating multiple humans at the same time. So with that being said, I think we're just about done for the day. Music in the background right there. Speak of the devil. Yeah, uh, music in the background means that we're just about done. Everyone, I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Great hour. I had a lot of fun uh, going over the headlines with you. Hopefully you got a lot. Uh, there were some other headlines we weren't able to get into. If you'd like to check those out, then uh, we'll include those in the show notes as well. Everything from Air France will be testing biometric technology. Microsoft is looking for uh, telemetry files with its security only update and the first ever electric mini explains why the CEO just quits. So everyone, we'll be back with more tomorrow. We should have Ralph Bond. Yes, that Ralph Bond on the program. It's going to be a fun show. Hope to see you there 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Monday through Friday. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be good.